Welcome to World of Tennis, presented by BNP Paribas. Each week, someone will be holding court with Justin Gimmelstab. This week, it's John and Patrick McEnroe. Justin talks to them about what it's like growing up a McEnroe, the state of American tennis, and the future of the sport. A unique opportunity to sit down with both of you at the same time. So I'm going to post some questions. Feel free to answer them in a similar fashion, or if you guys disagree, feel free. Growing up in the McEnroe household, John, what was that like? Well, growing up in New York, it's uh, fairly... Usually new. I get asked that question. Yeah. <laughs> he was a real yeah. pain in the ass. <laughs> God, he was so loud. And, uh, and we had a loud dinner table. It's not a total shock that I came from this area. I wasn't quite as nutty as a kid as I became as, as people think of me. Let's put it that way. I was somewhat normal. Actually, I think that actually helped me succeed in tennis. Patrick, for you, dinner table at the McEnroe house, past the dressing, please? Is that what it was like? That, uh, was, that was our father. That was our dad. <laughs> I think it came from our dad, so. Uh, uh, it was fun. I mean, I, I still remember our ping pong matches in our garage. And uh, John, you know, we, us throwing the pad. We used to have to, you know, retape the handles on the paddles. That was part. That was a. That was more. That was, that was one our of, other. Yeah, brother. that was one of the, only, the few places I, I didn't lose to these match. guys. So I mean, I mean, there's nothing to get that excited <laughs> about. Who was the better ping pong player? Um, yeah. I'd sneak away. Keep asking once questions. <laughs> that you know, eventually will be one that you know I'm maybe be not a dispute as to who's better. <laughs> I think I had my moments once in a while. I mean, there's you know, I mean, in, in Patrick's defense, there's a seven and a half year difference between us. So a 10-year-old playing a 17-year-old, it's probably a little bit one-sided yeah, in ping pong. The chips pump. were stacked against me <laughs> from the start. He had a good <laughs> backhand, okay, but uh, that didn't Like in tennis, I was the only shot I had. John, it's interesting, I know there's nothing that you do that's not conscious. There's not a lot of subconscious in, in the way you go about things. You just mentioned that, you know, I wasn't just a guy who had tantrums. I won a lot. Do you feel like that's been minimized and lost over the course of time a little bit? Since no, I, mean, I don't think so, but I think people focus and talk a little bit more about the other stuff. Mm -hmm. But I think at times there's probably some people that don't really take a real look at what I did do. Some of the things I do have been marginalized because no one gives a d about doubles anymore and no one cares about Davis Cup. And those are two things I took a lot of pride in as a, as a player. And fortunately for me, my doubles helped my singles. So and it was a substitute for practicing. Other people figured out, like Borg, Connors eventually, and then it just started steamrolling with Lendl and Pete Sampras. You can go down the list. They felt like they didn't need doubles in order to sort of uh, maximize their potential in singles. So now it's, even though occasionally you'll see singles guys play, it's, it's, it's a real shame that it's just, at, at this stage, it's almost like, to me, it's like, why are we even playing? Where does doubles go? I have no idea. I've often thought maybe they should start their own circuit um, to see if there could be a viable circuit that could be successful enough. Tennis has got to change. I mean, I'm not saying eliminate it because I know people make a living, but I, I, I think there should be a discussion about it. And that should be one of the options. I really want tennis to grow, and I don't see that happening, particularly in our country. You know, I mean, I think tennis, some of these guys, you watch these guys, and it's incredible to watch the defense that Djokovic plays. He's not the first guy that could play defense or Nadal. They've just taken it to this level because of the technology and what they've been given. But having said that, we have to put more on the table. As I mean, all of us are tennis fans and we all love the sport. And we got to think outside the box a lot more. On the topic of doubles, John has often been named the best doubles player of all time. The best team is anyone with John. You had an opportunity to play with John, not just the greatest doubles player of all time, but also your brother. What was that dynamic like? Uh, it was difficult. I mean, it was great when we when we won and we finally won a tournament at the Paris Indoors and decided to retire. To be honest, it was difficult because of that reason, because we knew John was the greatest doubles player individually ever, or right up there at the top. I was a very good doubles player. It made sense for us to be a pretty good team. But we were sort of, because of the age gap, we were at different stages of our career. For a long time, I was dependent on doubles to make my living. So there was sort of a pressure on me, you know, to make sure I had a partner and what my schedule was. And John sort of was at that stage of his career where he just wanted to play if he felt like it. And then probably the biggest factor was our dad, because he was more into it than, than either of us. So I think all those reasons made it difficult for us to 
you know, become like a legitimate team for a long period. But when we won a big tournament at the Paris Indoor, you know, that was great for me, obviously, to do that with him. And we could have been a legitimate team, and we could have won majors. I mean, just for the record. I mean, I don't even though we have similar styles, and sometimes it's good if one guy's a banger or a server, and the other guy's a better returner. I mean, obviously, that has something to do with it. And we were sort of good at the same things, but we could have figured it out. You know, I mean, it would it just it needs some time. I mean, any doubles partnership, you, you know, get, needs a little bit of time. It does. It can happen where you can pick it up the first time and win, but it doesn't always happen that way. More holding court with John and Patrick McEnroe a little later on. But next, John Wertheim and the editors from Tennis.com tackle the topic of drug testing in the sport. We'll be right back. Worlds of Tennis is brought to you by BNP Paribas, the bank for a changing world. And by World Tennis Day. Join the worldwide celebration March 3rd. For information, go to worldtennisday.com. Welcome back to Worlds of Tennis, presented by BNP Paribas. John Wertheim and the editors from Tennis.com, Peter Bodo, Tom Parada, and Andrew Friedman debate where drug testing is in the sport. A lot of memorable moments in tennis in 2013, some less savory moments as well. And like all sports, tennis has had to grapple with anti-doping and drug testing. And Pete, where, where do you think we are just overall as a sport in terms of tennis and anti-doping? Well, I think we're getting closer, and I don't want to say to nailing the, the, the guys who need to be nailed, because I, I don't know. And it's one of the really frustrating things for a journalist covering this is, if you really want to have authority on this subject, if you really want to speak in, in realities and facts, you have to dedicate almost all your time to poking around in the records, to interviewing lab technicians. I mean, it's really, really hard. There are people on this side of the fence say, that, well, the testing regimen is really weak. Talk to somebody else to say, well, they're doing a new kind of testing. It's foolproof. And, you know, to, to really sort out, this is, this is all like real deep science. So it's, it's really tough to get there. I think what was striking to me this year is that they're almost casting a wider net and catching bigger fish. I mean, Victor Troisky and Marin Cilic were two guys who were busted this year. And those, those are two pretty big names, you know. So it, it seems to me like the system is kind of the system is kind of working, and you know it's also discouraging that these guys, you know, whatever the reality is, they're all fighting back and all claiming innocence. How much of this is just inherent? This is just part and parcel with anti-doping. It's inherently a messy process. It's necessarily entails some obfuscation because of one positive test, the player might have an appeal. There might be a B sample. In the case of Silich, where we had a case where he actually went to Wimbledon and then withdrew on account of a knee injury that we now know is a bogus excuse. And I agree, the perception is terrible that there's this complicity and this excuse and that here he was with this positive drug test and they were trying to pass off that this was a physical injury. But the flip side of that is, as soon as a guy tests positive the first time, do you immediately issue a press release saying so? I mean, it's, it's really sort of a sticky situation. His case, I mean, I found his whole explanation fairly compelling. I mean, I don't even know if it's disputed that his mother picked up some medicine from a pharmacy and they were in a place that wasn't their first language and, and there was a, the substance that he was, was in his system was actually something that is permissible outside of competition. I mean, it seemed oh, like right. such a small infraction. Well, it's discouraging when someone like Djokovic, basically, who had you know, come out, you know, had, had put on the cloak of the mantle of righteousness and come out, you know, preaching about how important drug testing was in that, you know, a couple months ago, really, before the Troisky case and was, you know, such a firm, just like Murray, too, a firm proponent. And then Djokovic because his buddy Troisky gets busted is now you know saying that the system doesn't work and you know they have He's no credibility yeah, like yeah, simply because his buddy said I didn't do it well you know I got news for you your buddy could be lying to you I can understand where he's coming from in that one case though because the problem with that case is that Troisky says that basically someone told him you don't have to take this test well, today well, someone. because someone, the administrator, right, the administrator right told him he doesn't have to take the test today because he has this fear of needles and whatever and I don't want to give blood and, and he was told that that was going to be okay so it's a he said she said no one else is there to say Djokovic's point is G that given, uh, the players don't trust the agency that's administering this we want that communication to be clear that's why he feels like it's a bad suspension I mean I think players need to be more careful with what they put in their body maybe you know to the point of almost nothing you know during a tournament and I think from the administration side I think something like the Chilich case does look very strange, you know, it, that he was kind of given the, the silent um, the silent pass, you know, and he was able to kind of feign this injury and, and that was the reason given and it doesn't look good. Is this just the reality of sports today? 
I think it is, and the dope thing it is, because look, at, it's cops and robbers. It's cops and robbers as we sit here. This guy's wrong, no, that guy's wrong, no, that guy. You know, everyone's looking for the, for the, for the smoking gun, and look, there, there's very rarely a smoking gun. I mean, look at Lance Armstrong. You know, how long did we go before the truth came out? Who would have thought, you know? Well, Bonds, McGuire, Marion Jones never failed a drug test. But. Exactly. So you just, you just got to play it as strictly and simply as you can by the rules. That's why I think Djokovic was wrong, too, because you just got to go, look, the guy didn't do it. Sorry, but that's it. Thanks, Tennis.com. When we come back, there's more Holding Court with John and Patrick McEnroe on Worlds of Tennis, presented by b and Paribas. Welcome back to Worlds of Tennis, presented by b and Paribas. Now, back to Holding Court with John and Patrick McEnroe. What's the toughest part about being a McEnroe? There wasn't anything that tough. I think for me, the thing that I had to deal with was in my own head, getting to a point where I felt like I earned it. I got a huge amount of opportunities because I was a Mackinac. You know, and, and to some degree that helped me, but to another degree that in my own mind hurt me. And I think that frustrated John. That kind of ticked him off because he saw that I could do it. And I was like, I don't, you know, finally I had to sort of make my own decision. You know, I don't want any more wild cards. I'm going to go and play the challengers and quit doubles for a while and feel like in my own head that I, I earned it. You know, I could earn it myself. And if you earn it yourself and then you get thrown a bone, you get a wild card or two, it's a little bit different. But, you know, I kept getting wild cards, kept losing first round. And that was difficult, you know, that, that attention. Because then, you know, people still wanted to interview me. You know, because I, you know, I lost in the first round of qualities, even. So that part was hard, but at the end of the day, there's no doubt it helped me in every part of my career, including, you know, getting into broadcasting, et cetera. So all those things helped. Guys, where does the next American Junior Champion come? There's right an here. Yeah, there's an interesting dynamic. I mean, we are, yeah. John, we're at your academy in Randall's Island. You're in the private sector. Patrick, you are running the ultimate public sector, nonprofit, right. USTA. Does it come from either? Or does Democratic it come from first republic. Or does it come from <laughs> He's Des Moines? Getting, getting very well, heavy hopefully it stuff. comes from somewhere. And I think that's the point. Is it could come from anywhere. You know, and it could come from a combination. And it's, Very combination. Yeah, there you go. Pat's changing his tune. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm, I'm open to anything. Trust me, at this point, after five, six, almost six years doing this job, I've seen a lot. I think I've learned a lot. Uh, I think John has seen a lot and learned a lot since he started doing this. I want to hear him say that. Yeah. Well, he'll, he'll, that's up for him. To him <laughs> no, I can't but, say that. <laughs> but it, it's, I think it's just more difficult for that to happen. I think that for it to happen, I think it needs to be a group effort, to be honest. I mean, there could be one person that can you know, find somebody. But I think the, it's pretty unlikely that's going to happen. So I think it's a combination. I'm going to look back. This, I'm going to end this this way. I'm going to say that I was given a lot in tennis, as it turned out. I, there were certainly times where I was not handling that well. And you're, when you're a kid, you don't, it, it gets overwhelming. And, but when I look back, I'm saying, hey, you know, this wasn't all that bad. So to me, I really want to go out and make it happen again for our sport, because it was just boom. It felt so great in the 70s and 80s. And it was like the thing, it felt like the thing to do for a lot of people. And I feel like we're losing that. And, I mean, obviously, I want to be part of changing that. And the key to doing that is to f make it sexy in some way and to get kids to want to do it and kids to be able to afford to do it, which it hasn't changed. So, you know, part of, you know, people knowing the average Joe, maybe they know me from Mr. Deeds or Larry David show or whatever it is, or tennis, hopefully, or yelling on YouTube. They'll say, hey, there's a guy that... Hey, he played, maybe I'll play tennis because of him. And you got to go out and grab it. And that's what I'm going to try to use my celebrity for, to try to get people to turn this around and uh, hopefully uh, get some great athletes. I mean, that's the other part that, let's be real. I mean, these, we need to get the top-notch athletes that are playing football or basketball, for starters. You know, they're out there, and you're like, holy moly. These, these guys are unbelievable. So that would be the way I'm going to go after it. What is it about the sport? that you guys enjoy? Well, you know? we fell into it, I mean, to be honest. I, I, I loved to play basketball, and I played football and soccer and everything, and I was always better at tennis. So that was one reason why I liked it. And it's a, you know, it's a wonderful sport that you can play your whole life. You look at the other sports where these poor guys, all the difficulties they go through. 
Um, but having said that, it is way too unaffordable and expensive. We were lucky enough that my father worked long and hard to give us the chance, and we fell into some things. Like, if you believe in outliers, or you know, for whatever reason, I went to this place, and Harry Hopman was there, and Tony Palavox taught me to play, and you go on and on. And that's how it happened, in a way. But a lot of kids aren't given that chance. So uh, we have to provide that type of opportunity. But the game itself, we need to tinker with it, but if you look at the game of tennis, to me it's a great game. You know, I actually love it more probably than I ever did. Yeah, I think tennis is, is a test of so many different things. You know, I think it's a test of character, it's a test of skill, it's a, te a test of endurance, a test of your mind. And I think while, while we love team sports, and that was a big part of us growing up, I think the solitary nature of tennis is something unique. Obviously, you could say boxing, you know, maybe swimming, but tennis is you're 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 one on one against someone else, but you're also, in a lot of ways, one on one against yourself, um, and sort of testing yourself against an, an opponent. And I my my great memories of tennis as a kid was hitting against the wall. I mean, at the Douglaston Club, I used to you know literally have matches between Laver and Rosewall. You know, those are the that, that's what I remember is like the solitary repetition of that, while also liking other sports. But I think that is, that's the kind of unique quality that makes a lot of us tennis players crazy, that we like that, but also it's sort of unique and you gotta try to find that in kids. Patrick, you've gone your whole life being referred to as John's brother. John, what would happen if the day came where someone said, oh, I know you, you're Patrick Mack. I've had that a few times. It's, 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 dis it's disconcerting, but you know, he's got more hair than I do. So. I'm all right with it. It you took know, a few years to get there. They're like, Patrick? Yeah. Like, um, <laughs> yeah, maybe I still look pretty young. It's all right. Guys, thank you very much. Thanks for everything you're doing for tennis. Thank you. Thanks, Jesse. Time now for this week's Getty Images on tour. Andy Murray hired Yvonne Lindell as his coach two years ago, and it certainly worked out well. Murray has added Wimbledon and U.S. Open champion to his resume since the partnership began. It seems as if some other players might be looking for that same magic, with the recent hirings of some familiar faces as coaches. Boris Becker, Stefan Edberg, and Michael Chang. These new matchups are sure to bring a new twist to these rivalries. Thanks, Getty Images. We'll be right back. World of Tennis is brought to you by BNP Paribas, the bank for a changing world. And by the BNP Paribas Showdown. See Djokovic, Murray, the Bryans, and the McEnroe brothers, March 3rd at Madison Square Garden. Welcome back to World of Tennis, presented by BNP Paribas. Time for Justin's final take, brought to you by Tennis Express. There's no denying that doubles is in a challenging state. The Bryan brothers are the lone marketable asset in the game, and while they attract crowds in droves, they cannot sustain and protect doubles in perpetuity. Years back, the ATP made some adjustments to the scoring and entry system for doubles, and it has had a positive impact. More singles players are participating in doubles these days, and the shorter format does allow for more matches on show courts and high-profile situations. Indian Wells is a classic example, where sometimes eight, if not nine of the top 10 players in the world participate in the doubles. However, that's the aberration, not the norm, and doubles remains an afterthought. The teams challenging the Bryan Brothers supremacy are often patchwork teams that rarely stay together long enough for the public to build a connection with them. The Bryan Brothers have dominated doubles for a decade now because they're excellent tennis players that happen to specialize in doubles. In doing so, they have perfected the skills, angles, strategy, and intricacies of what has sadly become a niche business. Doubles players and fans believe the reason they aren't appreciated is they aren't marketed properly. Tournament directors contend they don't invest in doubles because it doesn't sell. Doubles does have a valuable place in the sport, but both the players and tournaments need to share in the responsibility to enhance the product. Teams need to stay together longer, even after a few tough losses. They need to look at this as a business and realize continuity is integral to doubles thriving. The tournaments in ATP need to commit to promoting doubles as it has earned its place in the history of the sport. Thanks, Tennis Express. Now, here's a look at the tour schedule brought to you by Wilson. 
For more of Justin's interview with John and Patrick McEnroe, you can go to StarGamesInc.com. The next episode of Worlds of Tennis premieres Wednesday, February 12th at 7 p.m. In the next Holding Court, Justin spends time with Pete Sampras. See you next time on Worlds of Tennis, presented by BNP Paribas.